It was uh, started in 1800 as a diocesan uh, school, a school where young men, young boys would be trained and educated to become priests in later life. That was its founding purpose. Its beginnings were in a thatched house in the Mall in the town of Tuam, and uh, the small college there was managed by a young Spanish-trained priest called Oliver Kelly. About 15 uh, years later, a uh, more suitable building uh, became available, a large house in Bishop Street, uh, formerly the headquarters of uh, French's uh, bank, and he acquired the lease of the building uh, from the French family, and they moved to that building, now known as the Old College, in 1817. Uh, throughout that century, then, it sent priests not only uh, in large numbers to our own diocese, but all over the world, to all the continents. And again, in the 20th century, it has continued to be the main source of priests for our own diocese. It was assumed that these were good places for character formation, and not only for those boys who were intended for the church, where this would be, if you like, the preliminary to their years in Maynooth and to their years in religious life for the rest of their lives, but also for those who would not perhaps go on for the church, but who would be the backbone of the society, the middle-class Catholic society, uh, as, as lawyers and solicitors and creamery managers and bank managers and so on. In my own time as a student here back in the late 50s and early 60s, it would have sent roughly 25% of each leaving search year on for the priesthood. The numbers in recent years have declined. The numbers going on for the priesthood nationally and maybe at a world level even has declined. And we find exactly the same thing happening in St. Charlotte's, that the same numbers of boys are not going on for the priesthood. Up we go. That's it. Beep, Carl, beep, Carl. Come and meet it, Carl. Come and see those words. And it's a good finish, Shane Wilson. Good finish. Make it count, Tommy. Make it count. Stephen Mullins. Let's go. Let's cross it over. On your toes, Ross. On your toes. Up we go. The eat, breathe, and sleep football down here, like. Before I came here, I had a fair idea that, you know, there's going to be a lot of football down here, but I didn't think it'd be as, that, as bad as it was. You know, I like football, but do you take it wild seriously, you know? There were nurseries for footballers or nurseries for hurlers. And Jarlots of Tuam is one of the key schools, the key schools in the country, where its sporting reputation in Gaelic football uh, was one of the key things which, which marked it as a special place and which marked its alumni as particularly loyal to it and particularly well bonded down through the decades. And here we are again tonight, commemorating a memorable year, 1947, in the history of St. Charlotte's College, in the history of Galway football, of Connacht football, and indeed of this association. We're talking here about the greatest Gaelic football nursery in the history of the Gaelic Athletic Association. Over the years, say from Charlotte's and from any other boarding schools around the country, Mel's, uh, in, in, in Leinster, uh, Brendan's in Killarney, uh, boarding schools all over the place would have supplied uh, uh, the top Gaelic footballers to their native counties. I, I really enjoy those years, yeah. Football made it enjoyable. We had a great coach in the Dark Money, and uh, it was a great personal friend to, uh, to all the lads as well as being a great football coach. It was in the 30s when the Connacht Championships started. And from the very, very beginning, uh, St. Charles were involved successfully. In the 40s, then 1946, the All-Ireland Series, the All-Ireland Colleges Championship was got underway, called the Hogan Cup. Uh, Jarlis contested the very first one of these and lost it to St. Pat's Armagh, but came back in 1947 under uh, the Doc Money, Monsignor later in life, Monsignor Michael Money, to win the first of the All-Ireland victories for St. Jarlis. As 47 wore on, we got through to the All-Ireland final it was an experience I will never forget. Something struck me coming in here tonight, and that was that there was a gentleman outside ringing the bell for dinner for half an hour, <laughs> and nobody moved, and I said, they can't be the people I went to school with. <laughs> It was the Vox Dei, they called it, the voice of God. 
and uh, you were supposed to answer the bell constantly. Your life was regulated by the bell and, and you lived by the bell and uh, you did everything by the bell. The bells go kind of every five minutes from half past on, kind of waking you up, you go back to sleep, you wake up again, kind of bells, and then at eight o'clock when people aren't up, the priests come in and they uh, get you up. <laughs> Nobody had told me about the bells at all, and uh, on the first morning when they, they went off, I thought it was a fire alarm or something like that. <laughs> When I came in here as a first year, there was 25 day boys, roughly, and there'd be roughly maybe 350, 370 boarders. Now that's a massive change. Today we have something like 131 boarders and probably 360 day boys. Well, in the 50s they came from Westport, Newport, uh, Belmullet, Dunmore. The boarding fee that time was about £45 pounds for, a, for a full year's boarding. We came in in September and I didn't see Dunmore again until the 21st of December. It was only nine miles away, but the system was that you weren't allowed out at weekends, and we went with that. It would be my first time ever living away from home, my first evening in St. Charlotte's in September 1957. Uh, early memories, the size of the place was intimidating. The size of corridors, the size of dormitories, the size of classrooms, the size of the refectory, the dining room, these were very, very intimidating. The meals weren't what they would be served up at home, for example, and particularly at Christmas time when the, the turkeys and the geese and the chicken was plentiful at home, and then what a letdown <laughs> coming back in the middle of January, and the frost and the snow and then the homesickness set in. Well, when we were here first, especially the first year or two, I remember standing at the window of the dormitory and looking, just looking out across the fields and being very, very lonely. It was a kind of culture shock as well to come out, to, to, to come out of the warmth of a home where you had parents and grandparents and so on who, who, who loved you in a very warm way and come to the kind of... Uh, in a sense, coldness of St. Charles College, where you were kind of initially nobody. You knew nobody, and nobody knew you. Uh, I found that very, very difficult, and would have experienced uh, a, a huge loneliness and a huge lostness for the first couple of months in the house. At the start of the year, it's, it's not nice, wasn't it? You know, it's gloomy and it gets dark early during the evening, and then you're sitting around here and the food's not great either, and, you know, you just... It's hard, you know, and, uh, you know, you'd rather be at home, but she you stick with it and you see what happens. To me, it was like, um, it's a, when I came from home, it was a great sense of freedom uh, to be in here with the lads of your own age and uh, to be upstairs and moving around. I remember writing letters home and I'd have been quite lonely, but my mother was a firm woman and she just said, don't worry, you'll get over it, and the advice was good. The letters were very important. We, we wrote every, every Tuesday, and they were vetted. They had to be left to the dean's room, and they were vetted before they were left open, as far as I remember, and we couldn't, uh, you had to be careful what you said. I write home a good bit. You know, you can say more in your letter than you can on the phone. You know, we, we rang home here too, because there's a big queue for that, sort of and you wouldn't be advised to stay on too long. It's usually the leaving starts. You'd be waiting for the phone, they'd just come walking up and get on the phone before anybody else, you know. And, They'd be talking to their woman and all that and seeing how things were going. Gradually then you settled in. You got into class and you got to know young la other classmates and so on. You got to play games. Uh, you got to know the teachers, the priests and so on. And you learned to cope. We, we liked tennis. We had two lovely tennis courts here. And my brother, God rest him, and myself used to play number one and two for Westport Tennis Club. Handball was a huge part of our life in Gerald's, especially uh, those of us who didn't play football. Um, it was a great outlet. Um, we had five uh, handball alleys, one for each year, in the college. The swimming pool was popular. Uh, it wouldn't have been heated to the same degree as nowadays, but uh, we enjoyed any sport that was available. Athletics was uh, a very important activity for the final term. Quite a few of the priests uh, were expert trainers, the likes of Father Brendan Kavanagh, Father Paddy Williams, Father Tommy Waldron. These people had a high knowledge of athletics, and in ways they were pioneers in Connacht because they taught us the skills of 
uh, high jump and pole vault and hurdles. Out here on the walks, we used to see the walks there. Um, that's where we used to spend a lot of our free time when we weren't playing football. Walk around and have a chat and have a talk like that. And many, many of the lads will remember those walks. It built great friendships because you tended to actually do the walks with uh, the same people all the time. Um, and it built great camaraderie as a result of that. Uh, I think your friends on the walks were friends for life. The walks were just uh, still there. I went out and had to look at it today and I nearly cried. To think that I was spending three months as a boy, 15 or 16, uh, going walking just every uh, half hour you're free, walking around with uh, two or three boys that you spent all your time with, round those walks, and you went nowhere else. You just went round and round and round until the bell went for uh, coming into study. Uh, a large number of our boys were members of the FCA and they were very uh, obvious in this school because they got the uniforms and they got the big green coats and they got the big brown boots with the tips and the heels of them and so on and they would wear those round the walks very often without laces in the boots so you hear the clip clap uh, right round the walks. They also uh, would have uh, gotten out on Wednesdays. We used to have a half day in those times on Wednesdays and they would be taken out to the rifle ranges for practice and so on and would be given food. Uh, so it was a very sought after uh, uh, organisation to be in. The FCA here um, was, was mainly for what we call fourth years and fifth years and we used to refer to it in our time as the Free Clothes Association because a lot of the lads that joined it joined it for the big overcoat because up in the doors at night it was pretty cold, there wasn't great heat at night and they used to use it as an extra blanket to throw over the bed. But they were what we call, I was talking to Father Hughes about this now, and the FCA would be for people we'll say, who, who didn't participate in football or something like that. It would be another outlet for them to maybe get out and do a bit of marching, whatever the case may be. Undoubtedly there was an assumption in boarding schools that discipline was extremely important, discipline of all kinds. It was a much tougher regime, but then life was anyways. Back in the 50s and early 60s, life was harsh and life was difficult. There weren't many extras in life at the time. A lot of the niceties which we take for granted nowadays in terms of uh, economics and money and human living and so on, we, we didn't have them in those days and we didn't expect them in a sense. It was a day, the days when, <clears throat> in families as well as every other place, corporal punishment was an accepted way of dealing with life and with young people and corporal punishment was part of this house. Above and beyond that there was the notion that moral character would be well served by a regime of rules and regulations, by a regime of self-discipline and of imposed discipline. It's the same thing every day, like get up at the same time, breakfast, clean your, like wash up, brush your teeth, then um, you know study, then school, lunch, school's over, football, then study, you know, it's the same thing day in and day out. Like the only thing that changes around here is the date. The food, of course, wasn't great at the time either. There was no such thing as cornflakes or any of the sugar-coated puffs that they have now in the morning. For breakfast, we just got a few slices of bread and a small bit of butter. But in spite of that, we tried to get a slice of bread and, with a compass, put it under the table for our lunch because we only got one slice piece of bread for our lunch at half twelve and that had to do us, but then we had the piece from under the table. Even though it was covered maybe in cobwebs, it still had the substance of bread. One day you get burgers and beans and things like that, and Tuesday's stew, Wednesday's chicken, Thursday it's fish, um, Friday it's chicken again. We have spuds every day at dinner time, so that never changes. You revolve around the table every day. Um, so if you're starting at the bottom of the table on Monday, you'd be at the top for you get chicken breasts on Wednesday and Friday, and the others get the legs. There was the grab, of course, the one that the pose, the grab of the sponge. I think it was called the grab. Yeah, looking back on it, there's probably traces of the Dickensian world left at that stage in Jarvis, all right. <laughs> The 
The opera tradition goes back, uh, heading for 60 years at this stage, started in 1944 by Monsignor Charlie Scahill. And every year from that on, an opera has been produced at Christmas time. Uh, the Gilbert and Sullivans and uh, many others. And it was always during, uh, say, October and November and December, a very, very important part of the life in the house. In the months of winter, it brought a sort of an element of, I suppose, magic and mystery and uh, strangeness to the college. You know, it was always a wonderful, you know, come up to Christmas when parents would, would arrive with uh, all, all dressed up and, you know, almost in, in black and white and the colour, and it was a very formal occasion. And, it was uh, always, uh, yeah, it introduced uh, another world to us, really. Yeah. Okay, one, two, three. Every Christmas we have performed an opera since uh, the, the mid-40s and this year is no exception. Uh, it's part of the tradition of the school, it's part of what we are, I suppose. Football is number one and sports generally and then I think the opera is very much part of our school. early 70s, uh, it was decided that instead of uh, Charles doing a show on its own where little boys had to dress as girls and sing as girls and so on, it was decided to join with the Mercy Convent who were just across the wall from us and uh, use boys from St. Charles and girls from the Mercy to do the shows. There was a novelty attached to dressing up, getting the costumes and of course and probably the biggest thrill of all was that you were actually communicating with girls from the Mercy on a regular basis. Uh, it's good, like, socially, you get to meet a few girls, you know, it's such a good for boarders locked in here. Second last night of the play, there's a half afterwards, just a disco for the boys and the girls. <laughs> we had hops, but uh, they were an all-male affair. You had hops in the top hall, where you went up and danced in terms of jiving, etc. And it was students with students, strange as it may sound. Uh, we had very little contact with the girls in the convent. You just wrote to someone. That was about as far as it went. On a bad Sunday, if we couldn't play football, the priest, the dean usually, or somebody, would ring the two convents, boarding schools, the Presentation of Mercy, to see what roads they were going on walks. There were three roads here, main walks. The convent girls took two of them, and we would be sent on the third in case we would meet. They try and keep us away from them as much as possible. Like um, the lunch breaks are on different hours, and they're, the press or the mercy aren't really allowed out. And uh, study periods are on different hours as well because uh, you're free from four to six here, and uh, they their study starts. I think it's at half five. Training a football team in the house was a huge responsibility. I remember when Father Maloney asked me to take over in 74, 75 season, I said, you know, that this is a daunting task. There's a huge tradition, a huge history, a huge expectation from our pupils and our teachers and our past pupils. So much so that, uh, Jarlis, when you went two or three years without winning an All-Ireland final, people were asking what's happening, has football died, are the golden years over and so on. So that it was a huge pressure on the trainer and it was a huge pressure on any given generation of young lads as well. Even though you weren't, and I wasn't a footballer in Germany myself, uh, it, football was part of us all. Our commitment on the side and to cheering on the team was as strong as the commitment of the lads on the team. St. Charles were the team to beat as far as everyone was concerned in uh, colleges football and uh, the school has an outstanding record as far as uh, the college scene is concerned. It's an absolute privilege to go up there and receive the Houghton Cup on behalf of the college, such a famous college like it is, it was absolutely a dream come true for me. The time I came back teaching then in the early 70s, there were a lot of uh, lay teachers in the house. 
And I think that had its own great influence. There were family men, there were married men, they had their own children. And maybe in many ways they were easier in dealing with young lads. Well, we weren't allowed to speak. The professors would meet you and they wouldn't speak to you. You know, they, there was a complete coldness there. And uh, I, I, I found that anyway. And, and it's, I don't know that it's, it's, they're very, very easy going. I've one, I saw one of the priests today and he had no colour to tan or anything on him, and that didn't do him any harm. No problem. No. No, did you play games this evening? Yes. Tugged out. And ball. And then in the 70s and 80s, we had uh, the first women coming on the staff. And I think that that was a major change in St. Charles as well. I started teaching in 1978. I think it was a bit of a novelty more than anything else. It was, it was something different, something new. You got a lot of looks on the corridor, I imagine. There are other changes. The, uh, the increase in the number of women teachers on the staff, which is very welcome. Um, we now have seven. Also, of course, the decline in the number of uh, clergy on the staff. The church provided an awful lot of free labour for education down through the years, no matter what a lot of the people say on the papers and they run down the church and they run down the religious and everything else, but without them, uh, including the Christian brothers and the Mercy Sisters and nuns, they, they contributed a great deal to education. They gave up their free time, their money went into maintaining those places, and uh, it's a big loss for Irish education and it's going to get worse. The Catholic boarding schools, the diocesan colleges, with their primary mission of training young men for the priesthood, but also of seeding the wider society with responsible, dedicated lay people. They unquestionably produced a very considerable, uh, if you like, achievement in terms of an educated Catholic middle class in rural Ireland and in the Ireland of the towns. If on the, the downside, as it were, by the fashions of today and by our own standards, the regime seems excessively disciplined or some of the, the curriculum seems narrow, then we shouldn't have the condescension of looking back on the past with the eyes of the present. In their own time and on their own terms, they did an immense lot to serve Irish society by the best of their lights, and they deserve the credit for that. They're closing now. They're closing to a great extent because of the decline in religious vocations, I think, that the staff are not available to man them particularly on the convents now. The Mercy was a boarding school, it's gone. The Prez here in Shum. Uh, Peters Wexford, Newbridge College is going. Union's Letter Kenny is gone. You can go around all the places, lots of places. They're just not viable anymore. The school is in the process of change, like all schools. I would hope that in that, that the character of the school would never be lost because the character of it is what we have always appreciated and loved and revered and respected. Where the future is in it, it's a very hard thing to know. Boarding schools gave a tremendous service to Irish society. They gave the opportunity of education to many, many boys and girls who wouldn't otherwise have got it. They also gave a wonderful training to young people, a training in uh, boundaries and limits and discipline and timekeeping and working and respect for adults. Uh, I would say a wonderful training as well as a good rounded education. I think at some level everything, every, almost everything I am today at some level either came from here or was added to here and, and, and was given direction here, you know. You say, you know, that your life will be better for you when you're older, like, you'll be, uh, if you ever have to go to work or anything, you won't find it hard because you spent five years in boarding school, you know. It, it certainly uh, gave us a good deal of character formation and helped us to, helped us to live better lives. If we didn't live better lives, it was no fault of St. Charlotte's. Some of the friends I made in those days uh, are still friends with me today. We still meet today. Um, we meet for a game of golf, we meet, and social occasions and past pupils union type of things and it's sort of like uh, a great bond was formed here sort of we were all in the same thing at the same time but I appreciate that other people don't have as good of memories as we have and that's the way they see it.